Hello everyone, bringing you a video today which features another interview with David Sayer, who served with the Royal Artillery during the latter stages of the Cold War in British Army of the Rhine, served in the Gulf in 1990 91, and also served two tours in Northern Ireland. Now, the tours in Northern Ireland and David's involvement in the Gulf War have been covered in previous interviews, and in this interview we're going to talk to David a little bit about his time in British Army of the Rhine, as I say, in that late Cold War period and late 1980s into the 1990s. Uh, so we'll, without further ado, we'll get into the main part of the video and listen to David's recollections. So here we are again with, with David Tay, once again, uh, who's going to be chatting to us this time a little bit about your service in the British Army with the Rhine, yeah. which was sort of the, latter, the latter days of the Cold War, I suppose. Um, so we've talked about your, your service history and so forth, I guess you could say, in, in previous yeah. videos. Yeah, so yeah. I don't think we need to run over that necessarily again. David's very kindly chatted to me about his service in Northern Ireland and uh, in the Gulf as well. Um, so in those previous videos, you also ran over a timeline, if you will, of your service. So David, can you tell us a little bit about your, your service in British Army of the Rhine specifically? Yeah, yes, yeah, um, so yeah I've got, I'd, I'd only been in the army about a year before I went out to Germany in 86. Mm. Uh, I think it was uh, February, February to March 86, I went out there and, and I served out in BOR Pretty much until the end of what would you, you, you'd call the end of the sort of uh, true BAOR period, which was yes. the end of 92, really. Uh, and, and yeah, so literally out there in 86 um, and was out there for about six, nearly just shy of seven years. Um, and uh, yeah, had, had a great time over there, to be honest. I found yeah. it a great posting. And that was punctuated by your deployments to Northern Ireland and... And yeah, Gulf absolutely. Well. So, you know, a, a lot of people that did serve in the British Army, the Rhine, actually um, were based there. But you, you also went to other places throughout the globe, you know. Yeah. So you, as you quite rightly said, you know, you deployed to, to Northern Ireland. Uh, you went to Canada generally, uh, yes. I'd say probably about at least once or twice a year in some cases, um, because the facilities out there were, you know, you had great ranges and is that to, to Battus? To, to <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, Battus. Yeah, field, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, you go out to Battus and, and, and it was all live firing out in Battus because you had the prairie yes. and the space and, and, and the ranges to do it out there. So yes. you didn't have the constraints of what you did on the ranges in Germany. So obviously I was in the artillery. So, you know, firing, you know, guns of range and, and impact uh, is, is le le less restrictive on safety procedures in in, in Canada and you, you get that ability to train I, I found the training in Canada absolutely superb I thought that was really good um, that's as realistic as training as you probably get for yes. the role that we were in you know so yeah yeah absolutely so fighting on the plains of Germany it's a uh, yeah absolutely a, yeah uh, prairies course, of Canada uh, yeah and obviously BOR you know that was all all sort of formulated along armored divisions wasn't it you know so you know, mobile infantry units um, all mobile and our, because we were mobile artillery, so we had self-propelled guns, you know, lots of tank regiments out there. Um, and it was all faced against facing the, the potential of the, the, the Soviet Warsaw Pact at the time, um, who were also, you know, heavily armoured divisions, you know, and the, yes. and the threat was obviously seen from the east, from, from those, you know, the, the masses that the Soviet Warsaw Pact had. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, but, you know, it, 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 was, it was one of those sort of strange periods, I think, in history that, you know, you had this Cold War going on, which yes. I think when I first went out there, Simon, I, I felt it was very real. Mm. Well, the latter part of it, it, it you, you see, I don't know if it was the fact you'd been out there a few years by then, but it seemed less less likely it was going to happen. I don't know if you, when you get out there, you're younger or whatever. Yeah, but, you know, I suppose it, you become jaded to the idea. Perhaps I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, absolutely. That, that said, no. of course, by, yeah. by the late the late eighties, you see, um, obviously there are observers coming over from Warsaw Pact countries mm -hmm. to observe yep. operations and, and exercises and so mm -hmm. forth. So I think there was a feeling that there was perhaps some easing intention, although with, yeah. well, especially with, with uh, Gorbachev and the Kremlin. Yeah. But at the same time, then there's that spike in concern when, when there was the attempted coup and so forth. So it's even at that stage, I think there was genuine tension. Yeah. But whether that would have, uh, you know, whether that heightened fears of an invasion of Western Europe, I don't know. Yeah, I, um, I, I think we, we we had we had um, a threat out there probably a lot more from the intelligence gathering aspect of it. Mm. You know, I don't know if you've heard of Soxmiss. Um, I, I have heard of yeah. yes, but not. So, so that was that was that was, that was a Warsaw Pact Russian-led intelligence group, and we had we had the equivalent which was called Bricksmiss. 
yes. and, and, and you used to have these these civilianized vehicles and the Russians had these 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 sort of four before vehicles with these special plates on and it was basically they were allowed to go over to the west and we were allowed to go over in small numbers over to the east and, and these these units were very very small units but they would go over there for intelligence gathering and one of the things as a British soldier you would carry what they'd call a Socksmith's card and it would tell you telephone numbers and what to do should you spot one of these vehicles right and, and there, there is yeah there, there's quite a few bits of information out there a little bit more now obviously with the the end of the cold war and, and time lapse but you, yeah i mean there's there's a few youtube videos out there that are you know if you're interested in in that style of the brick the, the cold war there's there's quite a bit about the old uh Socksmiths and the brick bricksmiths as they call yes. it uh, intelligence gathering and the idea was to you know enable each side to be able to assimilate what was happening either side of the border with constraints of small numbers yeah. obviously um so yeah you should get these little cards to it's, to it's, it's an things, overt you know. co overt covert operation it it's is, quite a strange thing really yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely very very strange I, th I think in reality that you know obviously looking back we, we saw the threat is very real at the time um like i said initially uh, later on some of the more more like i think direct threats that i I perceived uh, was actually from the provisional IRA who were then starting to spread to mainland Europe and carrying out attacks in British soldiers um, and British servicemen and women in in the uh, in the British Army of the Rhine so you know you had to be on your guard for your own uh, personal uh, security. Absolutely and I was reminded by the, the obviously you linked me through to there's a fantastic page on the National Army Museum's website which I'm going to link to in a pinned comment down below which you linked me through through to and i was reminded the poster on there saying obviously don't mm. wear mixed kit off mm. uh, you know when 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 off base don't yeah. uh put you know military stickers on your car and things like that yeah. to don't advertise the fact you're a soldier for exactly that reason and i was i'd seen that before but i was reminded of it just before the call uh, so yeah as you say it's an interesting thing that a lot probably a lot of people don't think about when, when we first went out to germany they used to have these what they call british forces germany bfg number plates and they were black with white letters and they were very very distinct for british servicemen serving out there that you could identify them as you know because they were tax-free and because you were a different nationality to, to obviously the west germans um they they were then pinpointed obviously by the provisional ira and made you an easy target so we yeah. then had this switch to if you had if you had a left-hand drive german car you got a german number plate and if you had a right-hand drive british car um, you got a British number plate back then and a false tax disc because we didn't pay tax out there of as course, well. Yeah. Um, so that, that helped to make you a little bit less uh, stand out in the crowd. And yeah. there was quite a few incidents of attacks out there on servicemen. And there was a sad attack. I think it was happened in the in the Belgique German border town. I think it was Romand, where there was there was some sadly some uh, some Australian tourists were murdered by the IRA who thought they were. They were British servicemen at the Interesting. time. Interesting. I hadn't come across that before. Yeah, there was there was an awful lot of attacks, and that that was a shooting, if I think. There was an awful lot of shootings. Um, a couple of mortar bomb attacks that I remember of as well. So yeah, you had to be on your guard uh, throughout that 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 period as well. So you'd come back from Northern Ireland tour, you couldn't let your guard down. But no, no. It, as long as as long as you were you were savvy and and you knew what you were doing and you weren't overtly sort of betraying yourself as a British soldier, you, you you know, you could mingle in with the crown quite well. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting time. I absolutely enjoyed my time in BAOR. I mean, the the adventure training aspect of it, take away the military training, was great in Germany. I mean, such a variety you could do from skiing to walking in the Bavarian Alps to, you know, sailing. Um, one of the sailing trips I went on actually was very interesting. Um, I think it was, um, I think it was Gobel, no Gobels, it was Goring's old yacht it was a 20 oh, wow. lovely lo <laughs> yeah, Brit the british army i think had nicked a whole bunch of them at the end of world war Two, and i think there was three or four of them in the british army sailing adventure mm. uh, area in keel in the northern part of Germany. yes yeah, yeah. Uh, and um you could go up there with a, a you know book this and go on a sailing trip with a skipper and they all had assigned british army sailing skippers and ours, ours i was a beautiful boat 29 foot yacht teak deck you know, brass bell had everything on it, uh, but that had previously been owned uh, by Goring. I wonder, what, uh, I wonder what became of them after the fact. I wonder where they are now and what's happened yeah, no, to them. Maybe I'll have to look, look that up after this. Yeah, that, absolutely. I think it was called Flamingo. I think uh, I'm trying to remember the name. We we had about uh, I suppose about 12 days sailing around the Baltic, around the Denmark, Danish islands. You know, absolutely fantastic times, adventure training, and of course it kept you fit. 
it gave you you know yes. uh, mental stimulation um you know and, and you were on the foot footprint of of europe so you know you could travel from west germany as it was then you could travel pretty much around europe within a few hours you'd be in a different country you could visit and you know it's absolutely fantastic you know i went to denmark holland belgium you know you could travel around and, and see europe well, you know as long as you got yourself a car or you rented or even got on trains yes fantastic, fantastic um opportunity to see the world as a young man of course you know relatively Definitely, yes as well, you know um so yeah the the the, the non-military side of it was great um i was talking to you before about the sort of military tests and exercises that we had yes out. indeed yeah, yeah. So uh, one of the ones I was talking to you about last time was um, was Active Edge, and a lot of people probably forgotten yes. what that was about, you know, and that literally was a, a standby exercise to to be able to deploy very quickly on the ground with your kit and your vehicles, um, should the inevitable happen and the Warsaw Pact, um, you know, actually start to invade West Germany. So ready at a moment's best. notice. Yeah, absolutely, and you, and you, your own personal kit, your kit of your vehicle had to be war ready so you had to deploy out on the ground with all the right kit ammunition everything in a in a in a position and then then they would come and inspect you and your kit and, and everything and make sure that you were there so you used to have a pre-packed set of 58 webin with all this kit list inside it ready to go you know yes <laughs> literally at the drop of a pack you could you wouldn't have to rush around drop pack and stuff so yeah absolutely that, that used to keep you on the edge and we used to have some terrific exercises out there as well um I expect you've seen film footage. I, I think the biggest one, which I did miss, uh, was Lionheart, which I think yes. was in four, and I've seen yeah. some film footage of that. But I, I took part in similar exercises with probably a less, le less bigger magnitude. But they were very interesting. I mean, you used to get all the NATO armies taking part in them. You know, you'd have all the, you know, from the Dutch to the Germans to the, yes. to the Danes. To, the, they'd some all have the contingents out there. You know? Some of them playing opposing forces in some instances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely, which made it into. I remember we had a particular exercise. I think it was the Belgique paratroops um, were playing enemy on one particular exercise. Um, it didn't go well for them when they attacked our position, but that's another story. Um, yes. But, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, so we had, we, had some, we had some absolutely great exercises out there, huge exercises. I remember one particular moment sitting on a sentry position when we we're in a hide location in this German wood watching this main road and the amount of military vehicles and hardware going down this road ranging from you know the small sort of Jeep Land Rover type vehicles to large leopard tanks to yes. you know, American tanks oh it's just phenomenal the night the NATO deployment of sort of kit and equipment and people was huge and and you would just deploy on exercise anywhere in West Germany yeah it was absolutely strange you know you'd you'd deploy in some poor farmer's field <laughs> or in his orchard or in his barn or you well, know and, yes. and, and the Germans just sort of accepted it if if damage did happen during the exercises there was always a, a rear party which followed on and and like swept the roads to get the mud yeah. and, 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 and that off the road but also if there was damage done to um, crops or property or anything like that then they would go around and see the landowners and they could put yeah. claims in. Maneuver, <laughs> maneuver damage, I believe it was called. Yes, right? it was. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And you literally, I think you had like a, a, a maneuver party that went behind mm -hmm. and were, were armed with brushes and things like that. The issue with, uh, with up obviously, you. the issues with military, military uh, exercises over privately owned civilian land, but it had to be realistic. You know, yeah, abso the... ab absolutely. And it was, you so, know. Sorry. What, was, what was your role specifically, David? Because uh, I know when you, you've talked about your, your deployment sure. to the Gulf, you yeah. were involved with, obviously, ammunition supply. You're on the limbers. Yeah. What, how did your role evolve in the Royal Artillery? Because I, I don't think we mentioned that. Just obviously, you, you were in the Royal so, Artillery. Most guys, when you join as a gunner um, from Woolwich, you, you get about three trades, uh, or you did when I joined. And, and it would either be in gunnery, uh, you would either get a, a signals course, or you would you would go on to um, uh, basic driving, right? So I did gunnery when I was at Woolwich, and, and I trained on the the 105 light gun. Yeah. Then I joined my regiment in Topcliffe in Yorkshire in England, uh, and I joined a gun gun team. Uh, because I had a driving license, they put me through my HGV license and my track license. So I then become and we evolved and then went out to Germany. I then become the gun driver of the gun. Um, so, you know, you're, you're a track driver driving the self-propelled gun. Yes. Now, I did that for very short, I think, one exercise in total. And then, then because they were short of heavy goods vehicle drivers, I then evolved on to forklifts and uh, forklift truck driving, Bedford drivings, which are really four tonners, yes. and stalwarts as well. I remember one particular exercise I took part in as a, 
there's a i don't know if you've ever seen these vehicles but uh, they're called eager beavers they're basically yes. a for, forklift yeah. truck well a very rudimentary forklift truck yeah. they're like they're like a bedford chassis with with the ability of a forklift on the front they're they're an awful piece of kit to drive because they're cold wet and miserable well yeah. i think i took part in this exercise in germany in about november december time funny enough wearing and i i did laugh when you done a, a program on it on the on the tank suit um oh yes yeah right? so i had a 1955 british army tank suit in tan that they gave me to drive this eager beaver in, because we're exposed to the weather of course <laughs> interesting to know they're still around at that time oh, yeah, like, not yeah, absolutely. well outside yeah. the time estimate i'd put Gosh, in a video yeah. so I, I wore this thing with with some like dpm pvc wind waterproofs over top to try and keep warm and dry and the only thing you had protection from the wind and the rain coming towards you was a perspex shield which didn't do you any good at all no complete waste of time so I, I i drove this for a particular exercise had a really torrid time driving yeah. this it's freezing cold soaking wet for most of the time uh luckily i evolved onto the stalwarts uh, the six per six yes and our primary role and again my primary role at that time was was ammunition supply to the guns so feeding the guns with ammo and keeping them supplied with that um i then evolved within the mt uh structure i became a lance bombardier got promoted at that i then become the troop MT bombardier representation. So you, you, you looked after half, you, half the batteries amount of vehicles, sure they were serviced, maintained and all that aspect. And then later I became the, the bombardier in charge of the uh, in second in command of the, uh, of the MT section. So you then I went and done a driver maintenance instructors course. So you then start teaching people to drive in all different varieties of vehicles, how to maintain it, how it service them. And I also did short spells in the service and base to maintain all the different variety of vehicles on site as well uh, and again amongst other duties you know so you would get spells as guard commander uh, regimental police all this sort of thing you and you'd, you'd rotate around these positions to give everybody uh, sort of opportunities to do different things so yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's that's pretty much where i went and like, like you said from a golf experience that's pretty much where i got allocated with yes. ammunition resupply as a lance bombardier um, and that's pretty much how my career went although i did other courses i did a, a signals course i'd done gunnery courses uh, but primarily, my my main core role was was really in in the motor transport section in the MT yes. section. And that's yeah. Pretty what I did. Um, sorry. So you said you, you obviously you've mentioned obviously that particular exercise with the Eager Beaver. You mentioned previously yeah. as well being in the in the hide overlooking the road yeah, and just sure. watching the watching the the vehicles and everything roll yeah. by. In in I presume on exercise, what you're talking about being in the hide and so forth, was that as part of an OP or were you just in a, in a fixed position for defence or what? So, so the way the artillery tactics work is, is, is quite interesting. So what they were concerned about was counter battery fire. So mm. you would deploy out as an artillery unit, but you wouldn't necessarily deploy in a fighting position, i.e. somewhere where you're going to shoot the guns unless um, unless you're, you're literally going to do that in a gun, what they call a gun position. So yeah. what you would do is you would literally go into a hide, what we'd call a hide, which is literally you get into a big woodland. And obviously West Germany was, was full of cops and large, large woodlands and area because you can hide the vehicles easier with the camouflage nets of with the overhead color. Now, if you're then going to start being used in an offensive or a defensive manner, you deploy into these defensive positions, you fire the guns and then you move. Now, if I remember rightly, the time factor from the guns firing to when the Russians were expected to be able to direction find where the guns were firing from was very quick. It was something like 18 to 20 minutes. So you would literally fire the guns and move. So fire and move, fire and move. Yeah. So we'd go into position, sit static. And if you've got a, a live or a dry firing, depending on the exercise, uh, a fire mission, you would fire that off and then you'd literally get cease firing and bug yeah. out. And so you'd be constantly on the move unless you were in hides um, waiting to but to then deploy again so yeah. you know, constantly moving around to prevent you know counter battery fire or, or aircraft homing in on you obviously which was perceived from the russian threat but been able to sort of take take the battery out the guns out you see and you operated all in batteries not as regiments and, and generally in bor we didn't operate at our full strength which should have been eight guns you generally operated at six right uh, because I think I explained in my Gulf War one, we, we made the numbers up in another unit. Yes, made that's the strength right, yeah. up Eight guns, which is war strength. Um, but each each battery did have eight guns, but they were sort of held in a maintenance area and they rotated around within the battery so that they got used. But, you know, that basically you didn't have a crew for them on, yes. on exercise pretty much. So, um, And some of the other idea there was that TA units, 
if we got to a an issue where there was likely to be a conflict ta units would augment those numbers and they would fly them out I was just going to ask that is would the numbers be made up with ta in a war so yeah yeah and i think that was rehearsed in lionheart if I remember yes rightly. yeah it was a big logistical exercise in terms of getting the ta out there and and, and reserves uh, yeah. exactly as you say yeah yeah, which is one reason it was so big. It was yeah, the, the yeah, it was transport. Of, of what I was, I, mean, I, I was quite disappointed I wasn't in the army then because it seemed yes. like a fantastic yeah. huge exercise and very interesting. But yeah, yeah. so um, yes, yeah, so primarily that was that was my role was yes. obviously in the bit of transport. Although you do a variety of different roles and different of course, jobs. Yes, while you're over there, which gives good variety to the job itself. So. Yeah. And, and speaking of the guns, obviously you, yeah. you, you've mentioned in training you trained on the 105, yeah. which obviously presumably would have been the, the self propelled the Abbott. In no, no, that's the one who's right. literally the light gun. Oh, which is yeah, yes, in, indeed. Yeah, yeah. In BOR, when you actually went out to BOR, what, yeah. what were the battery using in, in BOR? Were they on that? It was the M109A2, oh, which is you, ah, you're right, okay, which, yes. Which is the big, it's like the, the daddy version of the Abbott, which you yes. talked about. It's a really, it's, it's, it's a big 155 calibre mm-hmm. um, uh, gun. So we had to then retrain on the 109s. Um, actually, when I went to my regiment from Woolwich, uh, my regiment actually weren't on light guns then. They were actually on the FH-70. I don't know if you know that particular. I don't know that one. Well, That's a big no. 155 gun. Right. Uh, we, we, we were on that until we went out to BOR, and then we were in self-propelled guns, which were mm. 155 calibre again, um, but they were the M109A2s. Now, yeah. the, the, some of the guns dated right back to the Vietnam era um, that we were driving around in. So, And, and as did the stalwarts. The stalwarts are said previously they were all sort of 60s manufacture from Elvis. Yeah. I think what, the one I was particularly driving was the same year I was born. So, you know, oh, right. <laughs> they, were, they were quite old pieces of yeah, kit. Yeah. Um, but they, they were maintained well. Um, sometimes they were challenging to keep them on the road. Um, but, yeah, they were all sort of 20 plus years old pieces mm-hmm. of kit. Um, you know, we had ferrets as well, 432s, Land Rovers, Bedfords. That was pretty much what the, the, the battery was made yeah. up. And what what you get is you get the guns and the the support element of getting the guns in and out of action, which is obviously the limber, the the, the ammunition, which I talked about. And you have command posts. You have Alpha and Bravo. They're four three twos, where all the information comes to, and they disseminate that to the guns to give their data to be able to obviously fire on the target. Um, but also you have the the foo parties, which is the observation parties. Now they were all in four three twos, ferrets and Land Rovers, and they were then then uh, seconded to whatever unit we were supporting so if yeah. we were supporting the tanks or or the infantry those guys would then go with those if they needed artillery support these small parties of foods would would then relay the information back to the command post the 432 yeah. it would then pass it to the guns and the guns would fire on the target that's pretty awesome. much how it worked you know yes um, all, all done with backco at the time of course so i don't know if you've seen backco sheets which is all that letter numbered coded yes I, I have one somewhere i think slide I drill. yeah so yeah uh, part one of, my, of these boxes down here i think but yes i do uh, have one somewhere oh yeah. gosh yeah so that that was a big thing and um backco was was used you never sent anything in clear that was all sent no. backco by code uh, and one of the biggest things you did on your signals course which well the signals course i did was a six-week course using all the latest all the the, the ra- then radio equipment that we had but the big one of the biggest things was to come proficient in the use of backco mm. uh, and, and how you control. Now the sheets on backco were very stringently controlled from a security perspective. So you had to account when you finished using a particular sheet, which I think lasted only 24 hours. You then had to have that disposed of and accounted for. Yeah. Uh, they were worried about it was going to fall into the the rush uh, the, the super pack's hands. Um, so they were they were strictly controlled, which is yeah. uh, tech. You're always worried about losing your back coat. Well, <laughs> yes, I, I think I think that was a chargeable offence at the yes, time. So, yeah, I jump on that one. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, there, there was a few sort of unique things I used to like about Germany. And some of the things along that line was was obviously we talked about the socks miss cards. But a lot of people don't realise we were rationed out there as well. That was quite funny. Yes. Um, so you had fuel fuel coupons for your car. If you owned a car out there. You got an allotted amount of fuel coupons that you could buy tax-free fuel with, right? Uh, literally yeah. like a little old ration card, you know. Yeah. And you got those, and then you got tax-free. You could buy a tax-free car out there, uh, tax-free tobacco, uh, alcohol. But you were rationed on that. You had a ration yeah. card. So when you went to buy it in the naffy, 
you got it ticked off to how many you could be a lot. Of yes. Three yeah. times in it. To, to cut down on any black market dealings, I'd imagine. There was, there was but, a bit of that going on. Simon. Yeah, I, I could imagine there probably yeah, yeah. was. Yes. All soldiers are ruthless does, when they get older. Does not surprise like, me in the least. Oh yeah. gosh, yeah. yeah. So that 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 went on, um, and you had to get these from the from the paymaster in, in regimental headquarters, and you were a lot of this number, and you couldn't have more than that. And oh yeah, you had to go down with your ID card and sign these. I, I could have made a killing on that because I don't smoke, so <laughs> I was in there. And, and to be honest, Simon, I didn't smoke either, no. and I made a killing out of it as well. So yeah. you, you could get <laughs> acts of like four hundred, I think, um, for about a month of tax-free mm. bags. Um, one of the things that I did do um, was get cigarettes, but we used to have a German tailoress and tailor on the camp. And there was there was there was this lady and gentleman that you could take things to and they would tailor them to fit you yes. to make your uniform look smarter. Um, if you wanted to mod your your smock or your jacket or if you needed just your stripes sewing on your, your, your new yeah. sets of uniform, these guys would do it. And all you do is give them 200 fags and they were happy as Larry, you know, so. Uh, it wouldn't cost you any money at all. Um, yeah. uh, that, that sort of thing went on and that was accepted. You know, that was just like, well, yeah, but we shouldn't really have been passing the tax free no, cigarettes no, on to these Germans, of course. But yeah. I'm not surprised it happened. And uh, as, course, as you no. say, it's, <laughs> that's the kind of thing a blind eye has to be turned to because there's no way of controlling it at all. And, and, no. and thank goodness it did because I, I had some great modifications done on bits yes. of kit that out there. That Do go make on. Make your life a little bit more comfortable when you're yes. on exercise or whatever, you know, so absolutely. Yeah. Um, anything, anything specific? Anything you you sort of advise you you know that that you found particularly useful even well, in terms of modifications and yeah, things? Yeah, so, so, so some sort of mods was you, 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 I used to like the sixty eight jacket, the pattern mm. sixty eight jacket. It's very very strong, um, you know, well garmented jacket. It's well made. The downside of it, as you'll notice, is very smooth pockets. Yes, so they're, they're not bellowed out, are they at all? So yeah. you know, and also they only got one inside. If I remember, one inside pocket. Yeah. So what you could do is if you were an NCO, you always had notebooks. And like now, the trouble is with 68, it got a bit damp and wet. Trying to get things out of the pocket was a pain. So what you would do is you would you could take it to Taylor S with some material and, and they would make bellow pockets for you, you know, yeah. and mod them for you. The other thing I did like, which you always found kept me a little bit warmer, was using the old socks that you had worn up and use the, the top part of the sock. Yes. Uh, to make like a, a woolen cuff around your, 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 your smock. To keep the warmth in a little bit better, and you could yeah. pull that with your hands at night to to keep your hands a little bit warmer, and think little yes. things like that make an awful difference when you're out for, you know, some of the exercises I remember doing. We were out there for eight weeks at a time, mm. and you would be through November, December, January, February, March in Bo. It was was really cold, you know, and you were living literally out of your vehicle, yeah. um, and and whatever modifications or kit you purchased yourself made life that little bit more bearable. Um, Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and you, you would always do things like that. I mean, I, I even I even used to go, this is so strange, I used, there was an army surplus store in the town that I was at, which was actually uh, Lipstadt in Germany. There's a little army surplus store, and, and they used to sell some like nice little bits of extra kit that you could yes. get by buying some good, comfortable socks and, you know, little things like that that would make your life that little bit more bearable when you're on exercise. And a lot of guys used to go down there and buy, um, there was the German army folding mat that you could get. I don't know if you've seen that. Oh, yes. They, yeah. They like a little sort of rectangle shape. Well, you could stuff them out of the way easier than the big old roll mats and things yeah. like that. And you could sit on them like a mat. And, uh, little things like that make all the difference. A little bit more practical than the issue kit. And Ab yeah. Absolutely. You know, so and if you're out on exercise, which we were in Germany quite a lot, um, anything to make it better, like I say, was, yes. was, was always welcome. And I, I did buy some quite a lot of purchase private purchase items over the years that made my life well I, I talked to you when we, we talked about the golf I went out and brought a, a Bergen rucksack at the time yes um, not every guy got a GS service Bergen um, the food parties that I talked about earlier about they all issued the small GS Bergens yeah actually because they couldn't carry much kit in that they'd go out and buy their own so Berghaus was a very popular name and carry yeah. were a very popular name and guys would buy these in olive grab uh, olive drab green yeah. And, and use those on exercise. And I, I went for the Berghaus Rock. I bought one of those myself. Um, things like bivy bags, they, they were new out on the ground back then. Mm. So Gore-Tex bivy bags were quite sort of sought after pieces of equipment. Yes. Um, and uh, there was one particular company back in the UK I used to buy things off that you could get cheaper from British for Forces uh, Postal Service, uh, basically B BFPO. Uh, and you could get tax-free items from this company. They were called Penrith Survival Aids. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, now, they were very popular with the guys because you get things like bivy bags, um, w- waterproof socks, uh, better waterproofs, DPM waterproofs. Yes. Things like this. The, at the time, you know, you've, you must have seen the PVC waterproofs at the time which kept the water out, but you sweated so badly yes. on the inside that they were sort of pointless wearing, really. And some, some of the early ones were also, um, they were like an OG green. I think they had them um, sort of in the early 80s. They were like a crisp packet, and I think they yeah. got the nickname crisp packet because they just rustled like hell. And, you know, they were, they were awful. If you were trying to be stealth wearing them or those, forget it. Yeah. You know, it just didn't happen. Um, so there was lots of little bits of kit like that. And one of the, one of the early bits of kit, I, I think that, I've still got today is a, a green Helly Hansen um, jacket, field, yes. field fiber pile jacket, extra warmth wearing that. And another piece of kit I bought late on, I think it was about 89, was a, a buffalo fiber pile jacket. So I used to buy those and they they got like a Pertex out and but a fiber pile inside. Yeah. They keep the wind out and shower proof, not rain proof, but very, very warm piece of kit. And like I say, if you're out in Germany in December, you know it, it's, it's cold. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah. So, you know, a lot of guys used to buy little bits like that just to make life that little bit more comfortable when you're out. Um, also, I, I, funny enough, I got myself hold of a, a German army Bundeswehr um, sleeping bag, which had arms. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen. They're quite hard to spot now, but they, they, they were quite a valued item at the time. Yeah. Um, Interesting. You could you could have your feet pop out, though. So I, if you were out on exercise, you'd have the 58 sleeping bag, which we still yeah. had until the 90s. Um, and if you go into Canada, well, Canada was even colder. I mean, if you went out yeah. and exercised in some of the later Canada exercises, you were talking minus 20 chill factor at night. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the guys used to take two sleeping bags out with them, you know, so you'd, 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 you'd we're wearing all your, all your equipment and two sleeping bags, one inside the 58, yes. just to try and keep warm. Try right? and keep some of the warm thing, yeah. Freezing cold, oh yeah. Um, Little things like woolen gloves and bobble hats and things like that, you know, used to wear or balaclavas to try and keep yourself warm. Because you've got to remember, if you're driving armoured fighting vehicles or open top uh, guns like the gun drivers, they'd, they'd be wearing all sorts of layers to try and keep warm because they're yes. exposed to the elements, you know. Um, and if you're standing up a, a turret of a gun or you're driving a 432 as a commander or a driver, you're out to the elements. It's only the lucky guys that are in a Land Rover, yeah. or Bedford or a stalwart where you had you know, a cab around you and heating. Um, but if you've ever been in a Land Rover, I mean, the heat is in there. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> they're, still... not, they're not great either, but no. it's better than being exposed all the time. Absolutely. Uh, so there's all yeah. these little nuances you used to do to try just to try and make life that little bit more bearable. Though. A little bit more yeah. comfortable. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, because, like I say, uh, some of the kit, like uh, going back to what I was talking about, tailoring kit as well, mm. the 84 jackets, Although they, they, they were a lot lighter, and I, I never found the quality quite as good. I, I, I did still like them for summer wear because they were lighter. Yes. Um, yeah. The big problem is with those is the pockets used to peel off them. So you used to have to get them sewn down and make them yeah. more robust and little things like that. And, and, and I told you about the incident when we went to Northern Ireland. We had extra patches sewn in the back of smocks as well to reinforce yes. from, the, from the Aniba plate that went in the back of that. So there was all lots of little things like that you didn't. Yeah maybe extra pen pockets or it was down to the individual choice to be honest yes i certainly it's something that certainly seems to become very common in the in the later later stage of the 80s the modifying kit seems to become a lot more i guess a lot more accepted to the the powers that be yeah and private purchase kit for that matter as well absolutely in the 58 webinar course you know Mm. itself when get when it gets wet is is, yeah you know, it becomes heavier, it becomes more awkward, and it's it becomes stiff and awkward to get things out of pouches. A lot of guys used to stitch it together uh, to stop yeah. pouches falling off. But you've got to remember, it's probably been issued God knows how many times before this yeah. poor guy got it. So the clips would become worn, the, you know. So then then a lot of guys would get hold of spares of old, old worn out bits of 58, stitch them together, or have, uh, I expect you've seen there's lots of water bottles on the back. Yeah, lot, that was absolutely. very popular, where you could get like three water bottles stitched together. Uh, and, and even I, I know people literally stitched it all together bar the belt that you could slide in and out um, for your respirator and your ammunition pouches. And, yes. And everything else was pretty much solid on the back. You solid know? on the back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and a, a lot of the mods that used to go on were things like the 58 poncho roll. You know, a lot of people never rarely that I remember ever wore it below the kidney pouches. Yeah. Pretty much always wore it on top because um, that, that used to rub on your back of your if you were running or 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 yeah. doing a lot of tabbing 
you know it just got in the way so a lot of the times guys used to put it on the top i certainly used to do that all the time when i used to do um combat fitness tests which is a an eight yes. month run in, in full cfo uh you, you didn't want that rubbing on the back of your legs that would just chafe so you would you would tie that on the top of your yeah um of, of your kidney pouches and tuck that out of the way uh, yeah. oh, also, Speak. oh sorry go on no i don't want to stop you to say about training i mean uh, yeah. i was just going to talk about obviously being you know where we were a huge amount of mbc training of course you know? yes i was going to ask about that at, at some point anyway sure. but no you've got yeah. there before me yeah. yes yeah so you know we would always be training on mbc the the the, the threat from the warsaw pact from mbc attack a uh, nuclear bomb yes. chemical was was huge um so we were always doing lots of mbc training and i think when we first went out there we had the old green style um mm. NBC uh, smocks and jackets. I can't remember what mark that is. I'm sure you probably know. Simon. Mark Mark three, I think. The, probably, the, they made, they, the, the they hoods did make some of the Mark four four in yeah. green, but they're quite rare. Anyway, they, they weren't they weren't a separate hood. They were literally no, no. connected to the to the to the top. Sort of and dark then, dark bottle green color almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with the patches for the IPKs to yes. go on various yeah, positions. Yeah. Um, and then later on, we got the DPM version. Um, uh, going what mark of that i can't remember because well, they then, made the mark they did make the mark three in dpm so it could have oh, been right. okay right yeah mark three in dpm yeah. or, or the mark four yeah yeah and then because we went from the s10 to the s6 and you asked me on the golf war interview and i sort of reflected on that and i thought yes we did have the uh, the newer variety of the yeah, the, rest the of s10 it. by that point S10, yeah sorry yeah. Right. so we went from the the older version and that had the straw didn't it within yes you know, whereas before um before oh. we um yeah, I have one down there. No, I'm just, <laughs> yes. Uh, before that, we, we used to do drills of eating and drinking um, mm. in in a CS chamber. So, yes. you know, the, the instructors would love nothing more than, than getting you to go in a CS chamber and practice eating and drinking drills with, you know, you must have seen the old AB biscuits, which are like, yes. you know, like eating a solid lump of concrete. So they'd give you an AB biscuit and what you'd have to do is take your hood off your mask take a bite of that and then close it blow out and then chew on your biscuit you see well invariably guys would blow out with a biscuit so you'd get you know imagine the mess that would go on the thing is i've never quite understood with that because in in, from getting the biscuit to your mouth if there's vapor and stuff in the air yeah, I, I just I it. can't get my head around that, how that's supposed no, you're to work. Absolutely spot on there, so we say, what are we doing? Because you'd even <laughs> face the CS when you would do it, because they'd they'd put yeah. CS tablets inside the chamber, mm. and, and invariably you'd get this on your on your NBC rubber glove. The contamination of the CS would go straight on the AB biscuit, so you'd be biting it on your mouth already, you know. So you're quite. And, and the same would happen with everything more. Just, I think anything it was more just, toxic or deadly, <laughs> and and in the field, if you tried doing that, I, yeah. I well. Yeah, I, I just you wouldn't. I, I just, in reality, I just think you wouldn't. And the drinks. As I say, I'm I'm not I'm I'm not well versed enough in MBC <laughs> to to make any uh, yeah. any sort of actual informed comment on that. But I'm skeptical. Put it that yeah. way. Uh, uh, <laughs> we, we were at the time. We, we just said, well, we, we would be bloody AB biscuits if yeah. <laughs> yeah. if we're in the middle of a contaminated area. Why would you? That would be suicide. Yeah. You know? you'd, you'd wait till you're decontaminated, gotten into a clean environment. Okay. Before, Maybe for a chocolate bar. I think you can hold out eating an AB biscuit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the more important drill was always um, going to be drinking, you know. And thanks they put out the straw with the later variant with a different yeah. cap on the 58 bottle. And by the time we got to the golf, they'd done that. So yeah. the drinking drill, we felt more confident yes. in doing that. Um, and that was a far better, in, you know, far better in innovation with the respirator and moving forward. That was that was good. I, I've <laughs> always imagined, uh, I don't know that just going on to the golf very briefly, I, I always, always imagined that there was an attempt to get as much of the newest MVC kit to blokes going out to the golf. Oh, yeah. I know the Essex was still a, still around just about yeah. in 1990. Yeah. But I imagine men going out there would have been re-equipped with the S10 yeah. anyway because I, of the I, very real threat of. But when you asked me, and I couldn't remember at the time, yeah. I definitely had the the drinking straw variant. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and the amount of MBC kit we were issued when we went out there, you, we we probably had war stocks on. Yes, I, yeah, I yeah. I mentioned it on my my other interview. Literally, I had the old uh, kit bag literally uh, on my on my vehicle was full of MBC kit, mm. all different variants of different canisters, different suits. So I think we had three spare suits. It was yeah. it, the amount of kit they issued us MBC wise was phenomenal. Um, yes. Uh, combo, Whereas, pen, you know, combi pens and of F- course, F- yeah. Whereas in BOR, you reusing the same suit yeah, over and over absolutely. again for training. Yeah, 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 of course. Absolutely, and it's like yeah. oh, like Christmas here, you know. It's, that's yeah. Yes. Bit, you know. 
Um, um, yeah, helmet changes while I was out there. Of, of course. course, yes. Went yeah. from the old steel turtle uh, helmet, which was, you know, by that day, it was very dated. Yeah. Uh, we all hated those things. The most exercises, to be honest, we only wore the helmet pretty much when we went on sentry duty, on a guard duty, uh, to guard the position. Yeah. And then when you were mulling around under your camouflage net, uh, if you're in a vehicle or a gun, you pretty much wore your berry most of the yeah. time. And you probably see that reflected quite a bit in, in old Cold War photos. Yes. Um, once we got the, is it the Mark, it's Mark Six, isn't it? The, it's Mark the, Six, the yeah. The list, listing nylon, yeah, to replace the steel, uh, yeah. Pretty much that went out of the window and you wore that thing all the time then. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, it was like expected if you were, you know, well, the time you didn't have to wear it was when you were in your sleeping bag. That was it. <laughs> yes. I suppose the argument is that it is actually offering you more protection than the steel. So there's a there's a stronger argument to wear it, I yeah, guess. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, to be honest, it did. You know, it's a far better improvement um, mm. than what we'd had with the, the turtle. Some of the some of the guys on some of the vehicles had the AFV variant of the steel helmet. Yes. Um, yeah. you know, um, which which is just slightly more comfortable to wear than the turtle. I always found the turtle helmet when you when you lay down on the ground in a prone position, mm. it would like knock on the back of your head and push forward. So yeah. it was even, awkward to try and... Even know, with the sort of like padded that. liner in it rather than... Because obviously originally they'd had the yeah. same as World War II, the, the sort of pad yeah. and they yeah. really rock around. But even, oh, yeah. just, yeah. even with the later liner, it's it's not yeah. much better. Uh, always fun when you're trying to run with one of those on because they've got a nice elast- elastic strap yes. and they bounce up and down on your yes. head. It's chronic. And, oh, yeah, give you a right headache. Um, um, because at the time they always wanted lots of camouflage mm, you know it used to look like a, like a reggae pop star yeah and, you know with all this camouflage hanging off you which invariably when it rained would soak all the <laughs> all the water and used to weigh a ton yeah so, used to have, so when we got the mark six i was glad to get rid of all that old yes car, just with yeah. the cover on it rather than yeah brilliant you know <laughs> when, when did that actually change over for you when did you uh, get so the mark I, six, I got the mark six about i think it was about the tail end of 87 Mm. We, we had it before we went to Northern Ireland in 88. Yeah. So, yeah, it would have been about mid-87, mid, mid, mid 87, I think we got it. Uh, and the other thing we noticed in BAOR, mm-hmm. although we had some benefits of tax three things, which was nice off-duty, yeah. kit-wise, we were a little bit slow getting it than the UK troops. Right, OK. So, so um, distribution of equipment would be that little bit slow. So I, I should imagine, uh, I can give a good example, because when we're going back to the Gulf, when we were joined by some 4-7 field regiment guys, out there they came out with SAAs now, uh, yes. all the guys in BOR still had the SLR yeah they'd already done their their assimilation and training mm. and, and, and that and converted to the SA, SAA mark one although, although although there are those that would argue still having the SLR was a blessing in disguise it, it, believe me it was yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, to this day you know I, I I later left the regular army and then some years later joined the reserves and and, and used the SAA mark one um, quite extensively in the territorials for about another seven years. Mm. I hated the thing all the time. I never, yeah. never really liked it. I think the Mark II and the Mark III is somewhat improved for guys now, yeah. but I never really liked the SAA Mark I. It was no. all, always preferred the SLR. Um, and of course, weapons-wise, um, just to go over old ground again, we had, we had still had the Sterling submachine gun. Yes. Uh, we had the uh, the Browning high power pistol, um, uh, the SLR, of course, the GPMG. Uh, the converted brain gun, um, you know, the, yeah, the L4, Mark yeah. Three, so, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, I, I liked the brain. I thought it was a great LMG. Always, always thought very accurate, easy to operate. Um, just the magazines were a bit painful to lug around, but like that. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much the main sort of weapons we had to protect the gun position. Yes. Um, so, yeah, that, that was pretty much the kit. Um, and when we were first out there, there were still guys, and, and I, I had a very early pair of, or late, issue pair of dms boots were paid mm. but by then they were rolling out the first mark of combat highs and then the yeah. second mark of combat highs the second mark of combat highs i found better than the first um yeah. much, much improved and i didn't have a lot of issues with those in fact i've still got a pair i walk my dog in now so yes uh, well, I've there got you go. issues with, with with those as a boot uh, log some guys did go out and buy again go back to private purchase they did buy some of their their own boots and some mm-hmm. guys even bought um what was popular oh the german german para boot that was a black yes. black boot high leg boot very weighty boot but that was quite popular as well um so there's there was a lot of sort of i think if if you had black boots on and you wore dpm um you could pretty much get away with that on exercise yes not if, so much around camp not around around camp no, I must no. know. you'd soon get picked up by the rsm if yes 
um, if you if you certainly went out in sort of some non-uniform fashion, put it that way. Um, yeah, so you know, absolutely lots lots of variants, changes of kit, you know, yes. going through into the into then the nineties, and because the time. My last combat fitness test I did actually did with the SAA. We we mm. came back from the Gulf uh, in '91. As soon as we got back, we start as I said on the previous uh, one. We start turning everything back to green from sand, yeah. Uh, yeah. and then we got issued the SAA. We done drill with it, um, then went on the rifle range, and then just got used to training with that and, and converted over that and the um, LSW. Um, yes. And that was that was pretty much. Then we've done our like so. My last combat fitness test I did the latter part of '92 before we had the disbandment parade, mm -hmm. uh, and, and and that was that was pretty much it on kit really. What was interesting about the barracks, and I should have probably mentioned this at the beginning, oh, it, was, it, it was it was an old Luftwaffe um, anti uh, uh, anti aircraft, a flak yes. that had previously been. In, in the in the barracks, so and I don't they have all the sheds for the vehicles and things left then, because I yes, know they used to yeah keep they had yeah. yeah so they they were all still um done. I mean I recently put some photos of those on my Instagram account mm. showing the old barracks. Now our, the barracks was called Churchill Barracks, obviously after Winston Churchill post World War Two. Of course, but the, but the Luftwaffe flat unit that had been on there were 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 the same guys that had guarded the Mona Dam, which is obviously famous for the Dam Buster. Race. Yes. And the Mona Dam was literally, I think it was about a 30 minute drive away from our camp. Um, so that was that was really interesting from a history point of view. And, you know, these, these big German built sort of 1930s barrack rooms. Yeah. Were phenomenal buildings to, to build. And they're still there now. I've seen seen pictures on Google. That they're, they're, they're still up and running, been turning the flats and handed over to the German yes. civilian population. Um, but, yeah, that was a, it was a lovely barracks. There was only two units on my barracks. There was us. 49 Field Regiment and 22 Signal Regiment, um, and I've looked at the history of the barracks over the years, and I, I found that quite interesting. There's numerous, obviously, artillery regiments through there. Yes. But 22 Sigs in as a regiment had served in there for the entire sort of post-war period. So right. All the way from the 50s right up to disbandment of the of the barracks, and uh, but it was a nice little small barracks. You know, it wasn't huge. It wasn't a huge garrison barracks. So, like you say, you only have two units in there, and it's a, yeah. a lovely area to be in. Um, and, I, and I liked the town. It was, it was very, very yes. nice town. And how did you find how did you find barracks life compared to being out on exercise and stuff? What was your preference? Did you like being out exercise in the field? Exercise any day, Simon. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was always volunteering to do other things. I, I hated routine in the barracks. You know, I, I was never one for, 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 for guard duties, for w working in the mess rooms or anything like that. I was always, and, and I was always, if there was an adventure training, uh, scenario on, I'd put my name down. Yes. Uh, um, but I was also I was I was a keen sportsman in boxing, so I also did an awful lot of boxing for the regiment. Uh, I, I liked doing that, um, so I got the opportunities to travel around. And because of the I, I, I was in the box regimental boxing team, I got to visit Berlin, um, and that uh, was again that was that was quite an experience. Yes. So we got the British military train, which used to I can't remember yep. the station we got from, but it literally would drive through Berlin. And there was a few stops along the way where. When you would pull up at the at the station, out would come marching the Soviet packed troops, so the East Germans. East Germans, stuff. yeah. And they would all stand, you know, absolutely spot on with their drill. They'd march out with their AK 47s across their chest, absolutely stern, blanking you out. And you were, you know, you weren't allowed to take photographs from the carriage or, you know, lean out of the carriage or anything like this. Um, and it was a was a British, British military train run by the Royal Corps Transport. Mm hmm. And I think they did one of these train trips every day, nonstop, all the time. And they, every time the train came into a station, out would come these troops. Yes. They were forced from the Soviet pack to stand there in front of you. Um, yeah. But Berlin was very interesting. And I went there at an interesting time. So it was about January 87 when I went to Berlin for this boxing match. But we had a few days before the match took part. And we mm -hmm. could go around and look at all the famous landmarks, yes. you know, yeah. Brandenburg Gate to Checkpoint Charlie to the Berlin Wall to um, and, and um, oh, I'm trying to think the God I've got it in my head now the guy who's in prison Spandau Prison oh yes um, Hess Hess he was still in there when I was there yeah see? yeah so that was still still oh, going on and um, the changing know, of changing of the guard at the prison and yeah absolutely and, between the uh... and it was very apt atmospheric when I was there it snowed and mm. there was this, this feeling of you know you felt that this is the cold war you know when yes the reality sort of checked when you were looking at the east german guards the soviet 
and, and the Soviet guards were sweeping the, the memorials for these T-34 mm. tanks off the, the snow. And, you know, you, you could see all the watchtowers. And, and, and sadly, what was really sort of, sort of brought it home to you was, was all the memorials of people that have tried to cross from the east yes. to the west that have been shot and murdered in, 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 the, in the zone between the two areas on the wall. And and they they were they were quite abundant, you know. So yeah. that sort of stuck home the, you know, what 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 we're really there for. The actual human cost of of this yes, crazy absolutely. situation, yeah. 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 Um. And and again, you know, when we got to the end of the Cold War, sitting in in the barracks at, in Germany, and you were seeing the collapse of the Berlin Wall and all mm. these famous newsreels of people, you know, pushing the wall down and hitting it with hammers and trying yes. to drive through in their little Trabant cars and you know, uh, it, it, then you, we all knew something was happening then, and you know, there was a, yeah. there was a, songs came out at the time uh, and uh, in relation to that, and it was a sort of changing mood. And of course, literally, when we came back from the Gulf War, most of the BAOR was then starting to decrease in numbers. Of course, yeah. Um, and, and by the end of '92, the barracks that I was in ceased to be a British Army barracks, and, mm. and that was that. So it's a very yeah. rapid drawdown, absolutely. Oh, very quick. Very rapid yeah. drawdown. Yeah. 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 And, and and being artillery in Germany, we were there was an awful lot of artillery regiments in Germany at that time. Uh, uh, you know, I think we were one of the most abundant uh, regiments within the British Army at that time, the highest yes. of, of, of guys serving. Uh, and of course, they they looked at all these units, and I'm like, you're a small unit, you'll be the first ones to go instead of yeah, the gap. Yeah. So that was pretty much why we were picked out for early disbandment. And that was the catalyst that then sort of I, I then had a change of idea of leaving the army at the same time so and yes. that's pretty much i didn't really want to go for another unit at that time no i'd, I'd call it a day and, and that's why why i left when i did at the eight year point um yeah. why i think if the regiment had stayed together yes i would yeah, stay still longer. have stayed in there till done my 22 years but yeah. at the time i felt now that it's, it's this is sort of a reason to move on you know but yeah i, I did enjoy my time over there i mean the, the, the off time when you could go adventure training and and, and that I, I would I would love that you know and yes. like seeing the variety of what you could do was fantastic and where you could visit was great absolutely the exercises love those um, you know the countries I was trying to count the amount of countries I visited while based in Germany so I went from obviously Canada I talked away to Norway yeah, yes, to Denmark course, yeah. mm -hmm. um, we even had an adventure training trip out to India where we done a, a historical march in India our our particular unit uh, Toombs's troop had. They got two Victoria Crosses that had been won in the Indian Mutiny. Mm. So our battery commander organised a, a group of us. There was ten of us that went out to to India, and, and we we refollowed some of the routes of the march of the relief of Delhi. Fascinating. So, yeah, so I absolutely loved that. And when we came back, we we took an awful lot of um, uh, pictures and slide pictures out there. And when we came back, we had to then go back to the UK uh, to Lark Hill to do a presentation to the Royal Artillery Historical Association, which was some of the most high ranking guys I've ever yes. seen or retired. You know, there was generals, brigadiers and you name it in the Emporium at Lark Hill. And we had to talk through about all historical bits and pieces and put up slides and talk about what we'd seen and how we experienced and, and the historical aspect of it for a, it was about a, a three hour lecture with a break in the middle. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what an experience, though. Absolutely yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Amazing. And, and tracing the, the the history of your own unit, which has absolutely. got to be satisfying. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And 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 it was amazing in '88 is when we went. No, '89 when we went. No, it was, mm. it was the tail end of '88 when we came back from Ireland. That's it. Um, and we went out there. And and to be honest, there was still steam trains on the tracks. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, we were riding around in steam trains that everybody you know thought were an, an, so antiquated back in the UK. You know, and there we saw in half a dozen. My my brother loves. Uh, steam trains and i know you're you're you're, yes. you're really interested in, and i got loads of photographs for, for my brother out there where, where, yeah. where before that all went over to diesel or electric i imagine he was um, very jealous <laughs> oh yeah yeah it's fantastic i mean so, some of the trains there were, were were huge you'd have like mm -hmm. double 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 trains pulling up massive long yes. road carriages yeah. and you know they'd be doing about 20 miles an hour you know? <laughs> yeah. but yeah hell of experience so we got lots of opportunities to do things yes and, and I was going to say, obviously, sort of on that note, are there any particular memories, as I've asked in other interviews, are there any things that sort of stick in your mind as, as high, highlights or <laughs> low, low points as yeah, well are welcome? Yeah, um, uh, yeah I'll, I'll talk of a funny point. So we went yes. we went down to southern Germany on an exercise at Grafenwehr, 
Um, and that's that was American training area. Um, and when we used to travel long distance, we'd, we'd go on we'd go on trains. We'd load everything onto a a, a train, and that that would, that would be driven down. So all the track vehicles and that would would be driven down. There. Well, um, I was down there, and I was I was on a on a stalwart at the time, and yes. it was quite warm. I think it was a summer exercise, if I remember rightly. And we were all sleeping under the camouflage net outside. And, and I woke up in the early hours of the morning, and my mate was laying there sleeping in his, and it wasn't where it was warm, dry night, and he was sleeping in his sleeping bag. And I woke up in the very early, sort of early part of the morning, and I had, had to go do my um, facilities, and, yes. in, in, and I came back to the vehicle, and all of a sudden I could hear this snorting noise. And I was like, what the hell is that? Coming straight towards me was the largest wild boar, female one, oh. I'd ever seen. It was huge. Um, and she had youngsters with her. So oh, I was God. like, oh, my gosh. you know. <laughs> so I, I clambered up the side of my truck to get away with it. And she comes literally running right beside <laughs> beside the stalwart, looked at my mate, who luckily didn't wake up at that time, and then carried on going. I thought, oh, my goodness me, if I'd have got in the way of her and her babies, that would yeah. have been horrendous. you know. But this this thing was huge. Um, some, of, some of the more sort of not so funny times was – I'll go back to driving the Eager Beaver. Um, we did this long, long night move. It was a convoy night at, uh, drive, and it was early December, and it was freezing cold. And I was wearing that tank suit, um, and I was absolutely soaked to the skin um, wearing that thing. And the only thing that kept me going um, through that night was every time we stopped, and we'd stop about every two hours for about 15 minutes, I would jump off the seat, run around to my mate's stalwart, and they had these big louvers at the back of stalwarts where all the hot air comes out from the um, from from the engine. And I would stand in there to try and keep warm. Well, that was horrendously cold. Uh, and I suffered really, really badly at the <laughs> end of that convoy drive. And, and, and I always remember, you know, I, I basically suffered from hypothermia um, from, from that particular drive. And that was probably one of the coldest I have ever been. And I still feel now that when I get the cold in my hands, it... <laughs> It feels like that time. Yes. You know? and, yeah. and, and that was the endurance we'd go through. And some of the night drives we, we would we would take part in. You'd, you'd see guys swerving in front of you, and you know you just think, oh, this this is just mad. You know, we just hardly got any sleep, and we're still doing a 12-hour night drive from one place to another. And sadly, there was quite a lot of exercise. I, I know these exercises were great, and great to participate, but there was there was sometimes some really bad road traffic accidents. Um, mm went on and that was yes. that was quite sad and there was there was always an unknown tally of how many deaths would be allowed on a particular exercise before they would call a halt to it right um and, and there was there, there was always some you know they would they would always if there had been an accident they would always get you together and say right guys you know you know, we know you're all tired this is part of training but you know driving you've got to be able to stay awake you've got to concentrate and they'd always try and give you a a, a co-driver with you so if you're doing long convoy yes. drives, keep you awake. Yeah. But invariably, he would fall asleep, and you know you'd, yeah. you'd try to keep him awake. And it, some of those night drives were sickening. I don't know if you've ever had that feeling when you're very, very tired and you've not had a lot of sleep. You get this feeling of nausea in you because yes. you have. I, I do know what you mean with that. Yeah. And, and not you, probably not quite to the fatigue levels you were suffering, <laughs> but I, I come yeah. to the cusp of that. Yeah. But do, do you know what? When you, when you think about it, Simon. Um, that prepared me massively for what actually when happened when I went to the Gulf War. So yes. we had very little sleep. We drove lots of miles. So actually the training from that aspect, the physical endurance was actually fit for purpose. It did the job it was expected to do. You know, it were, were, the, were the night drives conducted with limited light as well? So somewhere, somewhere. And so it depended. If you were an army training area, you'd only be following a little white convoy light. Yes, convoy light. Uh, that yeah. would be a tactical move on a, on a training area. And in, and in Canada, you would do that all the time. In yeah. Germany, if you were on a training area, yes, you'd do it. But if you went on to a German highway, yeah, of course. you yeah. had to have full lights. You know, you, you can't have that, obviously, on a normal highway. There was limitations to that aspect. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there, there was good and bad in these exercises, but mainly good. It was it was always the worry of ac ex accidents and road traffic accidents and that aspect, of course, yeah. which is always concerning. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I, I just look back on it and I just think, yeah, I was so cold on some of those exercises. Really. Yes. You know, I'm fatigued. Yeah. <laughs> I look back now and laugh at it, but I didn't at the time. You know? No, no. I was going to say with hindsight in a, yeah. you know, nice and warm and able to, to look back and laugh about it. It's not yeah. too bad. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, 
the time. So, so yeah, there's sort of some of the bits. But some of the really nice periods was some of the welcoming points. Each, you, you, like the German farmers. Mm. Uh, I don't know what it was about German farmers, but they used to have these lovely big barns. And in a lot of the barns, they would sort of rent out for venues and parties. And mm. if you turned up as a British soldier, they'd invite you to come into their barn and they'd all have heating in these little rooms oh. and like a little bar in the corner. Now, on a weekend in Germany, you couldn't drive from Saturday through to Sunday night. There was pre, you know, you were prohibited from driving large HGV vehicles on the road. So it got to Saturday on exercise and you knew you weren't going anywhere. No, so if you're in a lovely location like this. The German, the German farmer would come out to you and he'd say, oh, you know, you want to come in my barn, you know, and. And, and if we all gave him like a couple of Deutschmarks each, he'd let yes. us all sleep in this barn, which is nice and warm and dry. And you'd be in there and he'd even start bringing beers out and sell them. <laughs> you know, Brilliant. You'd have a little party because, you, you know, you, you couldn't go anywhere. As long no. as you did your guard duties and you, you would sleep in there and get a bit of a break for 48 hours, which was fantastic. You know, um, and I know some of the guys and, and you, you would get an awful lot of diesel, obviously, in your vehicles for exercise. Yes. Some of us in a favour to the farmer would go, oh, you know, you want some diesel in your tractor. You yeah. Know? They'd go take a jerry can out and top his, top top his, his tractor, tractor up for it. <laughs> 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 no, but, you know, that's scratch my back, scratch theirs, and that used to work, well, you know. And, it, you know. It's interesting you sort of mentioned that sort of thing, because I always, uh, it's come up several times on reading uh, people's recollections on forums and things like that. Is uh, in the middle of an exercise and the, the Bratverse van turns up. Oh, and, uh, I can't remember. It's me. Um, yes. I think the guy's name. The guy's uh, name. Wolfgang. You both, Wolfgang, yes. Wolfgang had a fleet, didn't he, of vans? That my yeah. good me. How, and I've how, seen the I've seen the jokes that they were all Stasi agents, you know, and they, they were observing. Yeah, he probably was. Um, you know, you could be camouflaged up, Simon, in the middle of a training area, and yeah. this blue catering van would appear, and all these soldiers would come running out. Yes. Go and buy chips and and bratwursts, and you know, yeah. to get a nice hot fresh meal in. And and he'd be there, and he'd. How does he know we're here? You know, yeah. we're all cammed up. We're supposed to be seen. If he knows we're here, surely the Russians would. You know. Yes. Uh, but he was always there. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, he he a lovely old guy as well. And, and some of his employees, they'd always track you down, and they'd know where you were. I, yes. I'm sure they sure they'd have some source of information. But it's, yeah, it's yeah. just fantastic. It's, it's the power. It's the power of. Uh, it's the power of uh, money to be made. They'll find I, you. I, I'm, I'm sure many many ex B A O R soldier would probably vote. Uh, Wolfgang intro is a member of parliament or something, you know. He, yes, he, yeah. he should get a knight's order or something. Save your, he save probably saved a lot of poor young men from. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> and, and yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it was little things like that that used to make it absolutely superb, you know. Um, yeah, it, it's just just a, when I when I reflect back on it, you know, I, I think some of it, I like you said about soldiering in the barracks, I wasn't really into that, but some of yeah. that I used, to, I used to really love. It was, it yes. was good experience, and I'm glad again glad i served out in germany i to be honest i preferred being out in germany than i did the uk mm, um it yeah. was you had better better um opportunities to do more um than, than the uk soldier aspect of it so yeah, yeah. well it has been absolutely fa fascinating david thank you very much once again for coming on and chatting to me about this it's been nice to fill in the gaps between obviously the gulf and, and your northern ireland tours yeah. uh, and obviously bar in and of itself is is it, it's a, a key part of our Cold War history. It's very interesting. And that presence that was there, as you say, right the way through from uh, from the well, the end of the Second World War yeah. as an army of occupation and then to defend Europe. So it's been very interesting to, to hear your recollections. Thank you very much indeed for that. So there we are. A big thank you to David. I certainly found that interesting and I hope you did as well. Uh, if you have found that interesting and you'd like to see more of this sort of thing, then please do consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the little notification button down below. That will, of course, alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you would like to support the channel, you can. Both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below. And a huge thank you, as ever, to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. It's greatly appreciated, as I always say. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And if you'd like to get in touch but you don't really use social media, there is, of course, an email address down there as well. But that's everything for this video. So until next time, bye for now.